Today in Nigeria, fuel subsidy is a familiar phrase. Whenever it is mentioned, all eyes seem to turn to the federal government, the fuel marketers and fuel outlets. But not many seem to know how subsidy was introduced into this business of importation, distribution and sale of petroleum products. Dame Winifred Akbani is the founder, chief executive of Northwest Petroleum and Gas Company and chairman, Depot and Petroleum Products Marketers Association of Nigeria, DAPMAN. Subsidy on petroleum products came into being in the 70s. For those who were born there, if you remember, that was when we had the oil boom. And um, Nigeria benefited immensely. We made a lot of money at the time. But of course, making money because we had crude oil also translated into higher prices of refined products. And the government figured that if we're doing so well, making money from the oil boom, it was necessary to ensure that our people also enjoyed it. So the government thought it was important to give some form of subsidy so that um, refined petroleum products could be affordable and available to everyone. And that was the genesis of subsidy on petroleum products in Nigeria. As a policy, not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, governments around the world uh, have subsidy regimes for different things, uh, in forms of tax breaks or in forms of some sort of incentive to ensure that local production or local capacity increases. Unfortunately for us in Nigeria, subsidy has been around for so long that we got used to it. I think we spent about $11 billion in importing fuel in 2022. The projection for 2023, before prices were changed, was subsidy bill of 7 trillion Naira. What could 7 trillion do for this economy? That's, that's, that's the key message, why subsidy was not working, why it's a problem, and why it had to go. Amina Meina is the Group Chief Operating Officer, MRS Holdings, and first Vice Chairman, Dabna. I've been part of this whole journey from when the subsidy started and importation, you know, was at a time when the NNPC was only doing 30% of imports, private marketers were doing all the other parts, and it was working. I think at some point we had a very seamless, transparent process for the subsidy regime as a whole. Um, unfortunately, at some point it all got modeled up. You know, we went from having just six participants to having nine, having 12, and then we got to a point where we even had 100 and something. And then there was all that issue of the abuse of the process, which unfortunately the industry is still paying the price for. Fuel subsidy was indeed introduced following the global great inflation era of the 1970s, caused by a worldwide increase in energy prices. It was made official in 1977 when the then head of state, General Olusha Gwambasonjo promulgated the Price Control Act that made it illegal for some products, including fuel, to be sold above the regulated price. Well, subsidy is a form of price manipulation. It's a double-edged sword because on one hand it reduces prices below a market price. It's been tried many times by many governments around the world um, and it has the effect that you would expect but it has a deleterious effect in that it inhibits markets, it inhibits market participation. So when you have a below market price, that can reduce the incentive to produce additional supply. But a few decades later, fuel subsidy rose from a modest budget outlay to a behemoth commitment that gulped a large share of government's expenditures. Subsidy as intended by government was for the good of every Nigerian. It was a process that became faulty along the way. It's not the importer that is a scammer by virtue of importing. The scam came because some people got into it and were perpetrating fraud. In 2022, for instance, Nigeria's fuel subsidy rose to 4.6 trillion naira, that is 61.4% of the 7.5 trillion naira expected from oil revenue for the year. The dire economic implications of this huge allocation to fuel subsidy alone is better understood when you realize that oil accounts for 90% of Nigeria's export revenues and one-third of its gross domestic products GDP. 
the subsidy scheme had become problematic and concerning. The problem with subsidy was not the subsidy in itself, but the abuse of the subsidy. Um, the subsidy was now not only getting to the people or the Nigerians as the government wanted the subsidy to get to, but all of our neighboring countries. And that really was the problem because the price of fuel in Nigeria was much lower than the price in the neighboring countries, creating room for arbitrage. And some Nigerians, who I would like to call unpatriotic Nigerians, took advantage of that, smuggled the fuel across the border, and then subsidy sort of became something that was undesirable because not only were we subsidizing the Nigerian economy, we were also subsidizing the economies around us. This explains why successive governments since 1999 made vigorous attempts to abolish fuel subsidy as it had become an economic burden. As at the time government decided to subsidize petroleum products, there was nothing wrong with it. We had seen demand for petroleum products rise from say 30 million liters per day as recent as 2009 to like 65, 70, 80 million liters per day in 2020, 2021. So when you're consuming 80 million liters per day and you are subsidizing it, the impact is not the same as consuming 30 million liters per day and subsidizing it. Indeed, economists have insisted that subsidy was wasteful, corruption-ridden, and a criminal diversion of billions of dollars meant for the poor to a cartel and encourages smuggling of fuel to neighboring countries where prices were higher. You know, Nigeria, every good intention of government, there are some bad eggs, both on the side of government and the other side who will want to manipulate in order to cheat. And so, fuel subsidy have gone through a lot of challenges, challenges of corruption, smuggling. Even now, there is still fuel smuggling from Nigeria to the neighboring countries because the difference is huge, still huge. In neighboring countries, it is 1,200, 1,300 naira per liter. If they buy it half price in Nigeria, the smugglers are benefiting, not the poor people. Many pointed at fuel marketers as the beneficiaries of subsidy, but facts seem to suggest the opposite. The assertion that marketers are the beneficiaries of subsidy is itself is just a fallacy, it's just a myth. It's not correct to say importers or marketers were beneficiaries. We're not benefiting from anything. All marketers have never been beneficiaries of subsidy. Never. They've never been. They are vehicles for actualizing the government uh, policy of fuel subsidy. My reaction is that people are ignorant of what goes on in the industry. And so when they are outside, they don't know what marketers are going through. Yes, porters and marketers were making a lot of sacrifice to make sure that we had this product. I can tell you how many times we lost a lot of money. As a matter of fact, as a trader, you pray that at the end of the year, you have made more money than you lost. Because you sure will lose money. That's trading. Government is going to say, look, international price was $10. If you bought at $12, maybe at the time you had to buy, you couldn't find anything cheaper. Government is not going to pay you that extra $2. And those were the sacrifices we made. And I tell you that before removal of subsidy, we were all bleeding because everything was so regulated, you couldn't breathe. It was really, really a difficult period. And we kept saying these sacrifices were to whose benefit? The people are complaining, the marketers are complaining. A lot of people think that when they say a marketer has been paid subsidy, that amount that was paid in subsidy represents the profit that the market has made, but that's not correct. Subsidy is basically the government saying to me as a marketer, I know that your actual cost of bringing this product in is 1,000 Naira. However, I want Nigerians to get this product at 700 Naira. So my actual cost is 1,000 Naira. So what government ends up paying as subsidy is 300 naira. 
In actual fact, when you import a liter of fuel, um, before you even add freight and ship to ship all of your personal expenses, the cost of the liter of fuel in itself is more than the pump price. So what marketers were really doing was advancing credit to the government. You advance credit to the government because you bring in the petrol, the, the petroleum product and government says, sell it at a particular price. The difference between that price that you have to sell it at and the cost of it is what is the under recovery. But the marketers have borne that cost ahead of time. And then after the stipulated number of days, government will then reimburse you what you've expended. It's not all profit. All of us seated in this room were the beneficiaries of fuel subsidy. If you drive into a fuel station and you want to buy fuel, and you buy, say, 50 liters of fuel, that is actually worth 30,000 naira. If you pay that attendant 20,000 naira, just imagine that government is standing beside you, and as you're paying 20,000 naira to the attendant, Government is also paying the attendant 10,000 Naira on your behalf, not on behalf of the marketer. So every single Nigerian who was buying fuel and paying a price that was below the market price was enjoying the subsidy, not the marketer. By 2011, the subsidy fraud could no longer be doubted. Nigeria's average daily consumption of fuel stood at 29.3 million liters, but the government paid for an estimated daily consumption of 56.9 million liters, amounting to 2 billion 100 million naira daily. There is a lot of manipulations, you know, and corruption. Those of us who are in the industry, have been in the industry, and will remain in the industry for the long term, we were not. Um, there to play any games. We have structures, we've invested in infrastructure, in all that needs to complete the value chain of the downstream business. The government claimed that the difference of 27.6 million litres was smuggled to neighbouring countries. But the difference, many believed, was indeed due to companies making false subsidy claims on undelivered fuel. You know you can never make an excuse for bad behavior. But part of what, if I remember around 2011, was that the template was so faulty. I know how many times my company rejected imports. We just rejected because it was impossible to land. But some people figured, they thought they were smart. If I can do this and do this, I can cover my cost. But the reality is that good business practice, you must do what you can defend. And that's where we got it wrong. And so the federal government, on July the 5th, 2012, inaugurated the Aigboje Aig Imokwede Committee with the assignment to verify and reconcile the records of payments on fuel subsidy. The committee exposed an unconscionable corruption in the subsidy regime and indicted 21 companies. The federal government had been defrauded of $2.5 billion through overpayments. There were things that went on in the industry that some of us never even knew about. When the probe started and we saw evidence where we were told people would say they brought products and they did not, at first we kept saying it's not possible. But then over time we found out that it was true, but they, it was not done by just those people who did it. They connived with people. Right, because the entire process is such that you have, at the time, at least 12 government agencies that had to verify that you actually brought the product in before you could even submit your documents to get paid. You know, so it is true that there was corruption. I'm not sure that anybody can deny that because we all saw what happened. Unfortunately, it was the time that tainted the industry that made everybody just believe that, oh, everybody who is in oil is a, is a criminal. But that's not correct. In its final remarks, the Ike Imokwede Committee stressed that the idea of putting teams of technocrats together to pursue those who abuse subsidy regime is not sustainable. 
the lasting and final solution it recommended was the deregulation of fuel subsidy. Market pricing means market pricing at all classes of trade. But if we don't have our own refining capacity, then we are an import market. So the market price needs to be a market price for the product that we're importing. And, and this is perhaps the most critical thing for people to really understand about how the industry works, market pricing for Naira as well. So the first component, the most fundamental thing that we would need in order to have market pricing at wholesale, at retail, and so on, is for the Naira to be internationally interchangeable, freely, and to be able to buy and sell the Naira versus any other currency at a market price. But I don't think that anyone today could say that we have a market price uh, at retail, that we're not seeing a market price at the pump, we're not seeing a market price at wholesale either, because of the subsidy that exists on the Naira per dollar, on the Naira itself. And the problem with that is that access to the subsidized Naira is not available to everyone. But if we're looking for more companies to invest in this marketplace, we would need a full market for both. The regulation started 1st of June. Prices were moved and those prices were market reflective as at then. But what happened? The market is not static. Crude oil prices moved up, exchange rate devalued, but the price remained static. You cannot have a static price in a deregulated market. We're already feeling the impact of fuel having gone up to 700 naira per liter. So if today you increase the price again, you're going to have economic hardship in Nigeria. But the reality is that the price at which products have been sold today is again subsidized. By this time, many discerning Nigerians had begun to wonder whether fuel subsidy was a benefit or a burden. When, in 2015, therefore, the Nigerian government under President Muhammadu Buhari increased fuel price from 87 naira to 145 naira per liter, there was little or no resistance. Nigerians seem to have begun to realize that subsidy, rather than a scheme to help the poor and support Nigerians in general, had become inimical to the growth and development of the country through sheer corruption. If you look at how much government was spending on health, on infrastructure, on education, these are three key parts of the economy. If you lump these three things together, what we're spending on these three critical parts of the economy was less than what we're spending just to subsidize petrol. The reality is, and this is the question we all keep asking, how much of that commodity PMS, gasoline, which is the product that is subsidized, is consumed by the ordinary Nigerian. Let's face it, it's for the elites. Goods and services are not moved by vehicles that are powered by petrol. All the trucks you see on the road are moved by diesel. Diesel is deregulated. The common man in the village wherever is using kerosene, kerosene is deregulated. So really and truly, who is benefiting from the subsidy of petrol? In 2019, the Petroleum Products Pricing Regulatory Agency reported a daily fuel consumption rate of 57.2 million litres for subsidy payment of 808 billion naira. But the actual daily consumption rate was 38.2 million litres, leaving unaccounted for a difference of 19 million litres daily due to corruption and padding by the faceless cabal that many authentic depot owners and petroleum products marketers insisted were not their members, but machineries. There are people I called portfolio marketers. We in the DAPMA, we follow government regulations. We follow it to the last letter because we have address. We have town farm, we have invested. And so you, you wouldn't want your investment to have any challenge. And of course, the portfolio marketers, they don't have address. They can do anything to aid smuggling and do other things which are very, very uh, against the government fiscal policies. 
By 2022, the fleecing of the poor in Nigeria using fuel subsidy as a cover had attained unprecedented heights. The Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited NNPCL, told Nigerians that the average daily fuel supply from January to August 2022 was 68 million liters based on truck out data. Yet, the actual daily fuel consumption was put at 42 million liters, leaving 26 million liters unaccounted for. Again, the federal government blamed it on smuggling and claimed that Nigeria was practically subsidizing the whole of Africa. We as an association, we will meet periodically and we kept reviewing. If we as importers and marketers were not benefiting, Nigerian people were not benefiting, the government was not benefiting, why keep the subsidy? Greater benefits went to our West African neighbors. But smuggling the difference of 26 million liters per day across Nigeria's borders would mean that 788 fuel tankers with 33,000 liters capacity illegally cross the Nigerian borders daily. Once you have arbitrage, it's very difficult to police the borders, almost impossible. And I'm not holding through, I'm not giving excuses for um, the agencies that should have, but it was really difficult. If you put a customs man that you're paying 200,000 naira and the truck comes and they can give him 2 million, it takes a lot of guts for him to be able to say no. But people ask me, why should Nigerian people suffer? Because we cannot police our borders or because we cannot check fraud and all that. The reality is that we had also come to a level where it was almost ridiculous. The price our products were so low. The subsidy was too high. In the past close to five years, no um, marketer was important. And NPC was the only one important. So to that extent, are we going to say NPC is fraudulent? That means we're saying our government is fraudulent. Indeed, between January 2020 and June 2022, a staggering 3.92 trillion naira was allocated to petrol subsidy, and this surpassed the combined federal government's budgets for healthcare, education, and defense for the 30 months. The acute lack of reliable data, transparency, and accountability was simply stark. From the NNPCL, National Bureau of Statistics, Ministry of Petroleum Resources, and Ministry of Finance, None could provide a dependable data on Nigerians' daily fuel consumption. The entire country, whether it's the GMD of NMPC, whether it's the regulators, have all gone on record to say one thing. There are pretty good statistics on the volume of products imported into the country. The market is constantly fed and supplied, no problem. But how much of that 60 to 70 million litres of petroleum products, which are trucked out on a daily basis, actually consumed in Nigeria. Civic tech group Budget provided a detailed insight. In 2015, Budget revealed Nigeria spent 316 billion naira on subsidy, then 99 billion naira in 2016, 141.66 billion naira in 2017, 722 billion in 2018. 578 billion in 2019, 1.34 trillion naira in 2020, 1.42 trillion in 2021, 4.3 trillion in 2022, and 3.6 trillion naira for only the first six months of 2023. President Muhammadu Buhari's last year in office. We were like poor people who were still living lavishly without realizing that we could no longer afford it. So I think that subsidy actually became a problem midway into the life of the last administration. At a time when we were spending more than 90% of our income just to service debt. And in the middle of that, we're still spending a humongous amount of money just to subsidize one product called petrol. So distressing was the burden of subsidy that the federal government resorted to borrowing to pay for it. NNPCL then revealed that the federal government was owing the corporation $6.1 billion in fuel subsidy. 
the same government was burdened by almost 80 trillion naira in public debt. All economic indices and indicators pointed to a bleak future if the subsidy regime was sustained. Nigeria stood on the brink. If you want the industry to grow, then you have to allow market forces to determine prices. It's very simple. You know, prices have to be left to demand and supply. It's a very sore topic that you know, as soon as they say, oh, let market forces determine prices, people go up in arms, labor say, no, this is all that we get. The ordinary Nigerian says, oh, this is our only benefit. Government is taking it away from us. But I'm not sure that that's the way to look at it. Because the first thing you will find if the market is truly deregulated and allowed to function like it should, competition will eventually drive prices down. The Bretton Woods institutions, including the World Bank and International Monetary Fund, called for the removal of subsidy and tightening of Nigeria's monetary policy. The voices of credible oil marketers, epitomized by the Depot and Petroleum Products Marketers Association of Nigeria, DAPMAN, had been consistent in their call for the removal of fuel subsidy, a testament to the fact that they were neither a cabal nor beneficiaries of the subsidy racket. You know, every idea has its time, right? I think the conceptualization of subsidy was a good idea at that time. Um, but many decades later, and with all of the abuses in the system, subsidy became something that was stalling the progress of our economy. And it was important for us as a nation to sit down and relook at this, have a national discourse. It was time to remove the subsidy because we can use those resources for more long-term benefits for the entire nation and the economy. In any case, it's always a greater benefit to economic development to subsidize production rather than consumption. And subsidy was subsidizing consumption. And not only Nigeria's consumption, once again, but consumption of, you know, the neighboring nations. That man intensified their call that removal of subsidy would help to put an end to fuel scarcity, eliminate unnecessary hardship on citizens, reduce waste, and stimulate responsible consumption. When prices of crude oil increase all over the world, Nigeria, like any oil producing country, should be celebrating because we export a lot of crude. But fuel subsidy made it impossible. And I made this analogy sometime last year that it's only in Nigeria we cry that crude oil prices have gone up because we're using most of our crude oil to exchange for refined products. That was the evil of subsidy. The fuel subsidy regime was so mired in corruption that the three leading presidential candidates promised to abolish it if they won the election. With no budget, for fuel subsidy and in strict adherence to his election campaign promise, the newly elected president and Buhari successor, Bola Hakmet Tinubu, in his inauguration speech at the Eagle Square, Federal Capital Territory, Abuja, finally dropped the bombshell. Subsidy is gone. We, we, were, we were all very excited. For us, it is a welcome idea. We jubilated. We were happy at the fact that it was the first thing he said on the day of the inauguration. He said subsidy is gone. We expected him to remove subsidy, but okay, maybe a few months into his administration. But surprisingly, on the very first day, while still in the inauguration ground, he screamed subsidy is gone. So it was like what we're waiting for over a long time just happened. The people also reacted. The subsidy removal for me was very, very impromptu. Even though uh, the other presidential candidates had equally said that they were going to remove subsidy. But Tinubu's announcement was impromptu because it took Nigerians unaware. There were no incentives put on ground to take care of the effects of the subsidy remover. If you ask me, it was a good thing. Yeah, but I think the problem around this thing is the fact that you were going to drop such bombshell 
without really considering the processes through which this thing goes down. It's a problem. And it doesn't seem like a solution is coming anytime soon. Companies are cutting down. Unemployment is rising. I was devastated because I expected the cushioning effects, but unfortunately that wasn't provided for. Like prices of things have gone up. You can't buy things the way you used to buy them before. Like I remember buying eggs for 40 naira. Now one egg goes for 120. Um, obviously there's been you know, untold hardship because of um, the subsidy removal. But um, I'm of the firm belief that if the money is utilized, you know, properly, at the end of the day, you know, Nigerians are going to smile because, you know, um, nothing good really comes easy. So we just hope that there will be, you know, light at the end of the tunnel. It's, it's, it is welcome. To, of course, there will, there will be, there will be the, uh, the side effects of that. Naturally, there will be side effects of that. And, uh, but then too, I believe, uh, I believe it's, 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 it's going to be for a while. Things have been put in place, you know, uh, palliatives here and there, the state governments are any more than, more than they've ever end. I'm sure uh, there's, there's, there is a light at the, at, the, at the end of the tunnel. I receive it with very bad feelings because I know that it's going to bring on total hardship on, on, on the masses. It's going to bring increase in prices. Our prices as we speak now is skyrocket. What you buy for, what you buy for five naira in the morning is not what, it's not, it's not five naira in the afternoon. The president's three-word statement abolished subsidy on petroleum products, which NNPCL said cost Nigeria $867 million monthly. The president promised palliatives that would drastically reduce the harsh effects of subsidy removal. He assured Nigerians that savings from subsidy, which has been put at 7 trillion naira annually, would be spent on infrastructure, education, healthcare, and job creation, among others. But if you look at the amount of money that's been spent on subsidy, maybe that money could have built a primary health care center in every local government in this country. There's 700 and what, 74? How much is it going to cost you to build a primary health care center compared to how much has been spent on subsidy cumulatively? You could have done education, which could have been free up to secondary school. You could build roads. What was the entire budget for roads last year? And how much was spent on subsidy? The savings in the subsidy, if you, for instance, direct it in the area of infrastructure, we believe all the federal routes in Nigeria will be fixed. And then you direct the savings in the subsidy in the area of uh, security. Nigeria will be more secured. Despite the president's palliative promises, Nigerians stood still as they tried to digest the seeming reality of subsidy removal. And almost instantly, the pump price of petrol shut up from 165 naira per litre to over 500. This would be followed by galloping inflation in cost of goods and services. But the Nigerian governors, petroleum marketers and many stakeholders welcomed the announcement. Dapman, led by its chairman, Dame Winifred Apani, paid a courtesy call on the president to express the support of her association for the policy and pledged to donate CNG buses to support the president's palliative initiative, which he had started with the announcement of 5 billion naira for every state, including the federal capital territory, Abuja. We are not unmindful of the fact that subsidy removal will hurt uh, citizens who are in the lower rung of the economic ladder. So as um, people who are socially responsible or companies who are socially responsible, we, we had to throw in our own palliatives. So we were happy with the government decision and that's why we decided to support the government in, in the endeavors for in subsidy removal. I must uh, commend the government in the strides they've taken to ensure that People are conscious of the fact that you can convert your cars to CNG usage, which is more cheaper alternative fuel and even cleaner. I know CNG is natural gas. So we're not talking about doing big plants for processing and all that. No, we don't need that. So palliatives are okay. And I think government also gave 5 billion to its state. But like I said, it's just a relief of the symptom. 
we need a cure. And the only cure we can have is that the economy begins to improve. Rating agency Moody's said Tinubu's pledge to remove fuel subsidy and unify the exchange rates was credit positive. But Moody's also warned of risks in the initial period. Higher inflation, weaker economic activity and more social discontent. Moody's was right. With the steep rise in the price of crude oil in the international market and the sharp fall in the value of the Naira since the coming of the new administration, the policy of fuel subsidy stoppage has encountered serious challenges, especially from the Nigerian Labour Congress, the umbrella body of labour unions in Nigeria. After some complex and protracted negotiations, warning strikes and short-lived strikes, the government and labor managed to reach an understanding on palliative measures and minimum wage. Prior to the removal of fuel subsidy, you know as much as I know that at least 10 states could not pay salaries. They could not pay minimum wage. Minimum wage was 18,000. They moved minimum wage to 30,000. A lot of the states were complaining that they couldn't pay. Even without minimum wage, they were owing people salaries. Some states were owing salaries for up to a year. Why were they owing salaries? They were owing salaries because every month, they go to Abuja to share money. And there is no money to share. They used to say every month, NMPC was not remitting money to FAC account. Why was NMPC not remitting money to FAC account? NMPC was not remitting money because most of the money was being spent on fuel subsidy. If labor understood properly that the reason the people were not earning their salary was because of fuel subsidy, even labor themselves would have encouraged government to get rid of this fuel subsidy. But perhaps the most problematic challenge of the subsidy removal is the acute shortage of foreign exchange and sundry charges at the ports that have hampered the ability of fuel marketers to regularly import petrol. Like paying MP and Imasa in dollars, when local companies, why are we paying in dollars? They'll tell you it's international business, but I have to go and buy dollar in the open market. So that also puts a lot of pressure. If you consider that on the average, you consume at least 30,000 metric tons of petrol a day. You calculate how much that is. Look at how much pressure we put on our dollar. But when there's a, a huge shortage as we have now, that creates a problem because on the international marketplace, all petroleum products are priced in dollars. So if you don't have the dollars available, either for credit or for cash, how can you buy that much product? Does that not necessarily create shortages of itself? It's a big issue. It's a long-term issue. We have asked government, remove this payment in dollars and let us pay in there. But recently we were told that in the next few months, they would have achieved what they need to do before they can do that. And we say that they should do that as fast as possible. In the last administration, um, at some point, the central bank used to match the upstream businesses, upstream companies with the downstream so that they could provide the dollars to them. Those dollars, it was monitored, we could then use it to import. Um, and that way, there was a reduction in scarcity. So it may be good to sort of revisit that to see, is that something that can be done? Can it be adequately monitored so that if the fear is that it might be abused, if you monitor it, then it won't be abused. Another thing is taxes. Minimum tax. We cannot be paying minimum tax on petroleum products. As a corporate organization, we should pay taxes on our profit. We cannot pay minimum tax on turnover. So if petrol is 600 naira, I have to pay minimum tax on 600 naira, irrespective of whether or not I've made money. They will tell you increase taxes and the country will be better. People have to survive before they can pay taxes. So we think that that is certainly one thing government needs to look at. And to a very, very large extent, we need to work on how products are being supplied to the market. We're almost back to NMPC, so supply again, because of the access to dollars. 
For most Nigerians, what matters now is the palliative the government is providing to cushion the pangs of subsidy withdrawal and how money saved from subsidy removal can be properly channeled into development of the country. Analysts and stakeholders, however, warn that the key to gaining public trust and to check any potential social and economic unrest is for the government to be transparent and accountable on the use and investment of the financial resources saved from removing subsidies on petroleum products. For the stakeholders, President Tinubu's government, with its innovative frame of mind, must quickly resolve the foreign exchange snag to avoid a socio-economic crisis that may quickly erase the recent gains of subsidy removal. All that is needed, they say, is for the fuel marketers to be given access to the official forex window or allow them to source their forex needs from the oil exploration and production companies so that they, like NNPC Limited, could resume importation of refined products unhindered. For them, this will engender competitive pricing that will lead inevitably to a reduction in the pump price of fuel to the delight of Nigerians. And now, their final word. Make no mistake about it. The future of this country is very, very bright. A country of 200 million people is a country with huge potential. Nigeria is a country of the future. I'm betting on this country. We need our government, in addition to whatever they're doing for the people, to think like the investors are. What is it that will attract a foreign investor to Nigeria? What is the infrastructure that's required? What is the financial infrastructure that's required? What are the, what are the rules, what are the regulations that they would like to see? And if we become more and more aware of that, I think that we'll be heading towards the right solution so that we will get out of this because Nigeria has massive potential to be not just the leading country in Africa, which it already is, but to really be a leading economic powerhouse. As the crude oil production increases, as more Forex is available, as more as friendlier policies are implemented, allowing FDIs to flow. If the government continues with these friendly policies, what we expect to see is a sharp increase in investment and production in the upstream sector, which would directly translate into economic benefit in terms of FX availability. So I'd like to say to Nigeria is that, one, we need to be patient. We need to believe that things are going to get better. And we also need to actively work towards Nigeria and things getting better. Government should channel some percentage of the savings in subsidy to develop CNG. Let me tell you, when we develop CNG, the cost of production will be reduced. The demand for petroleum product will be reduced. And when you reduce all these things, the pressure in foreign exchange will reduce and the price of dollar will come down. At the end of the day, there will be an economic boom. The bottom line is Nigeria has to improve enormously its economy. The economy is weak. That's why Naira is weak. That's why people are poor. A $3 trillion economy is possible but government is not going to be able to do it alone. We all have to put hands together and do it. We have to consider the fact that the subsidy we were paying was unaffordable. As for palliatives, again, I have a strong bias against giving people the short stick. We need cures. We need to cure the economy. We need to cure the country. Indeed. With subsidy removal and more money accruing to the three tiers of government, Nigerians now expect President Bola Hatmet Tinubu, the governors and other elected leaders to strongly address the current harsh economic climate to ensure a quick recovery of the economy and rapid economic growth and development. God bless Nigeria. <laughs>